let's begin. Uh, let's uh, begin by acknowledging the tradi traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, work and play. Uh, it will be a different uh, a different group in each of the areas where people are coming from. Where I am, uh, the as the Wurundjeri people, uh, I'd like to pay respect to their people, their culture and traditions, and pay particular respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us today. So thanks for coming along, everybody, and I'll hand it over to our MC today, Nazir. Thanks very much, Sal, and thanks for all the panelists for joining us. As Sal mentioned, today is a discussion, a webinar on uh, make the best use of your NDIS or TAC plan. We've got um, people here with lived experience of being on TAC and NDIS, so. Hopefully, um, you know, we've got our own points of view on what's worked for us, what we found really helpful, what hasn't, and um, hopefully we'll get some questions coming through as well. So I might make a start with introducing myself and we'll go around as well. My name is Nas, I work for AQA Victoria. I had my injury over 30 years ago, believe it or not, diving into shallow water. So I've got a complete C6 injury, but and, uh, you know, life's been good. Uh, hopefully it's the same with everyone else. But uh, I was self-funded until NDIS came about. And since uh, the start of NDIS, my life's just improved so much, you know, but it's really important. Uh, I'm learning as I go, I guess, of the benefits. And a lot of people are. And uh, hopefully the discussion we have today will be a bit of a shortcut for people to know what they can get and what they can't. Um, so that's me. Um, just looking at my screen, I'm going to go clockwise. So next on the list is Ian. Ian, Me? yeah, good one. thanks, Nas, for that. Yeah, yeah. Very good one. Um, yeah, my name is Ian Douglas. I'm a what they call a C4 incomplete quad. So I had a C5 and C6 fractures with a C6 dislocation. So I'm an incomplete quad. I have movement, some movement in my arms and some movement in my legs. I can get up and walk around a little bit, not, not a lot. Um, and I was involved in a, a car caravan accident back in July 2019, so three, just over three years ago. Um, spent three, three weeks up in Princess Alexandra Hospital, two of those in intensive care, and three weeks down in Austin. And then I came down over to Royal Talbot. So I'm covered by TAC because we're in a car that was registered in Victoria, and I'm a Victorian resident as well. Um, to give TAC credit where credit's due, they were very good in the early stages of the funding saga. My, they paid for my two children to come up from Melbourne, there and back again, paid for accommodation, um, yeah, and, and, and did whatever they could. And uh, I had no complaints about that at all. Even back in Melbourne, um, very quickly after I got back to Melbourne, they started looking at the, the house and modifications to the house. Um, and we had a meeting, well, I think it might have even been October that year. So it was about two or three months later about the modifications of the house, which commenced the following year. And they were very good with that. We had some, how will I put it, some minor discussions with them as far as what, what they were doing. Um, and we had to pay a little bit to have some extra, extra um, modifications done, but they were very good in that, that aspect. So I can't complain there. Um, they also funded a, um, a van for me. Um, all I had to do was pay the insurance we got back from our, our motor vehicle and, and then they paid the rest. So the, the van itself cost 60,000 and I think the modification about 130 odd thousand, so. Yeah, no, so, that's excellent. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. And I guess um, we'll, we'll actually get deeper into what, yeah. we've, what we've got from um, TAC and what we've sort of learned um, uh, we'll go over to you, Lockie, if you want to go next. Yep, I'm uh, Lockie O'Brien. I broke my neck in a rugby accident about 12 years ago. It was, I'm, and that left me a T2 incomplete paraplegic. Um, so I obviously got the end out. Yes, I think you rolled out about seven years ago. Um, helps me with a lot of the riding I do. I work at a company. I work at AQA, sorry. And um, yeah, compete in hand cycling. 
Excellent. Thanks, Lockie. Um, Paige, now we'll go over to Paige, who's got a really good experience about um, how the NDIS works. And um, over to you, Paige. Thanks, Naz. Um, my experience is very different in that I have no personal NDIS experience, um, but I am a support coordinator with a Kiwi. I've been here for almost two years now, and I started um, with Noha Alhanafi, who's our team leader. Um, I am from the U.S. originally and have a degree in exercise physiology, so transitioning from the United States over to um, Australia and Victoria, where the NDIS and Medicare and all of these you know, standardized public health systems and, you know, funding opportunities exist was pretty eye-opening. Um, so feel very fortunate to get to work in systems like this. Thanks, Paige. And over to you, Emily. Um, hi, I had my accident in 2018. I'm a T4 incomplete. Um, it was a car accident, so I'm with TAC. And I also live... Uh, Regionally, Victoria, so out of Melbourne, regionally. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Emily. And Georgina? Hi, hey everyone. Um, I am a T7 paraplegic. I got a spinal cord blood clot back in 2003, so 19 years ago. So I am an NDIS uh, participant um, on my fourth plan. And um, yeah, so I've got a bit to share with you later on. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. And Josh. Thanks, Naz. Uh, yeah, so Josh, C6, C7, uh, quad incomplete. So I'll be actually coming up to 18 years in a chair. So I had my accident back when I was 18 in a car accident. So on TAC. And I think the biggest thing, Naz, you know, the words I've been hearing, you know, we've said, say, learn. Uh, goals, you know, uh, un I think the key is just understanding and that's the biggest thing I've found over my time and my uh, my experiences is just understanding the processes and then making that, you know, work for you and your individual needs, Naz. Excellent. Thanks very much, Josh, for that. Um, I want to go over to Paige now, even though, like, um, we know NDIS, what NDIS is, but just in case there's people out there that are new to NDIS and um, when it started and why it started. Um, Paige, if you can give us a summary of that, that'd be great. Sure. So the NDIS started in 2013 um, and it is a scheme. It's not welfare. It's um, you know not means tested. It is individualized to each participant that comes into the NDIS. As many of you probably know, of course, it's also not limited to physical disability. Um, more and more, we're seeing even more of a range of disabilities, um, whether they be psychosocial, physical, um, you know, traumatic accidents, or what you were born with, um, as long as it is, as it is, excuse me, lifelong and permanent, that is qualification for the NDIS. Um, support coordination exists solely within the NDIS. Um, our TAC participants would have case managers, um, very, very similar, just different titles. Um, but again, in kind of connecting you to your supports, understanding the funding that you've been given and um, working to either get more funding for specific parts or appeal decisions that have been made, um, just the other person to help kind of complete that loop. Um, but again, it's uh, a system specifically in Australia um, that I know of, and I don't know if it's replicated many other places in the world at this stage, um, but surely that could be a big help. Excellent. Thanks, Paige, for that summary of uh, NDIS. Um, Ian um, touched on how helpful he found TAC come into it. Uh, a lot of people, when they're on TAC or NDIS, uh, just go with the flow. You know, they just don't know what they're eligible for. And the, they pretty much uh, need to be told. And that's good and can be bad as well because your coordinator with TAC or LAC with NDIS if they're good and educated, I mean, they can sort of guide you along on, you know, what, what your goals are or what sort of stuff you need to put in place to um, live as independently as you, as you want to. 
just wanted to, now this is open to anyone, but just wanted to sort of see in the early days um, how they found TAC or NDIS uh, as in being helpful and not having to wait until the last moment to know that they, they, um, they were eligible to receive some supports or modifications or equipment. I'll kick it off now if you want. So, you know, when I had my accident, I was 18, uh, the NDIS wasn't about then, but uh, I think having that assistance financially, so for my wheelchair, for uh, my accommodation, it was massive early on. And uh, let alone having also the continents, you know, all covered. So I think uh, early on that piece, uh, you know, it was, um, it was one less thing you had to worry about after having your injury. And before I pass the next person, also Nala, there's some questions coming through hot and fast, so it's good as well. So really encourage those people to keep asking away and we'll address them shortly. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for that, Josh. So yeah, look, uh, guys, keep typing your questions out and we'll answer them as we, as we go and when we can. Just wanted to add as well, I mean, this webinar is um, scheduled to go for an hour, but Towards the end, we're going to invite everyone to uh, all the guests to come on and ask questions as well, um, as in, you know, by voice, uh, if that's what they want. Um, what about anyone else? I mean, um, they... yep, yeah, go I um, for me, at the start, I felt they were a bit pushy. I was in interim accommodation in Melbourne and I lived in Euroa. Um, and they were um, already trying to get me to start working and stuff like that, even though I wasn't even back home and start trying to push me to start driving. I wasn't ready. Um, so, and then there was, because I was in interim accommodation for like a year before I could go home. There's all dramas around that. Um, so at the start I felt, and it might've been because of the coordinator I had at that time. She, uh, she was a bit pushy and I had to learn to kind of stand up for myself because if I was someone that just let go with the flow, they would have like pushed me to do things that I wouldn't have wanted to do. Um, they even wanted me to get an SPC because I had to have help go in the toilet and that's something I didn't want. <laughs> so because I was able to stand up for myself, I was able to, yeah. Um, I mean, that's a great point because a lot of people uh, would assume that you know what they're told they have to go with they wouldn't know what their options are and I mean uh, you don't want to rock the boat as well you know you're getting looked after or you know or you know you're supposed to be getting looked after by TAC or NDIS and people don't like rocking the boat in case they don't want to lose what they've already got and get on the wrong side where you, um, things get harder they don't want to get in that position where uh, they ask too many questions and get on the bad side of um, TAC or NDIS. See, there's lots of questions coming through and we'll answer this um, throughout, I think, because it's not an easy answer and it's something that's developing pretty recently. And uh, a lot of people that are on TAC, they've been asking the question, um, NDIS, people on NDIS seem to be getting more or it's easier for them to get equipment or services um, and are you able to get both? If you're a TAC client, can you also get NDIS? And uh, we're finding uh, the answer is yes to that. Now, the benefits are limited, I think. I mean, you ask different people, you're going to get different answers, um, as in what sort of benefits you can get. And um, does someone want to help me answer that question? If you're a TAC, can you also get NDIS? And what sort of things are, will you be eligible? Um, yeah, sure. I can answer a little bit about that. I haven't done it personally, but I know people who have done it um, with exercise because TAC is, their philosophy is about getting goals and seeing progress with the goals. Um, and they'll keep funding exercise, especially going to spinal cord injury recovery gyms. They'll keep funding it if you're showing progress and reaching goals. And they're less likely to keep funding it if you aren't progressing as fast as they'd like because they, they're not big fans of maintenance. They're more like progress. Um, so some people have then chosen to do NDIS for, just for exercise. So everything else gets 
TAC funded, but just the exercise is covered by NDIS. And then it's that works for them better doing it like that because I've been told NDIS you can you don't have to reach as much goals like show as much progress as TAC to get more fund funded for it. But I I okay. haven't done it personally. That's just what I've been told. No, that's fantastic, Emily. Um, on the same, I've heard people getting equipment and modifications as well. Uh, I don't know exactly how that works. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's got to be uh, a goal of yours to achieve. Um, you can't just sort of want something and, and, and think you're eligible. You know, there's got to be a reason for it. Uh, but the question is, how do you show uh, that you, that is part of your goal and you, you need it? Uh, Adding to that, Naz, if I may, I've also heard um, for individuals wanting SDA, so the acronym's escaping me for now, but I might throw off the page. So, you know, um, supported disability accommodation. I should know this one. Correct, um, you got it. So, yeah. So if I do throw the page, do you mind actually speaking about that a little bit and what that is offered to the NDIS and then also the TAC community? Sure. So I can speak very much to the NDIS side. Um, I'm sure it's a bit different. You know, Emily, you were speaking about your goals and your progress. Um, Living arrangements and especially modified living arrangements are um, very common within NDIS funding and they are very difficult to um, attain. Initially, it can be. So your SDA, which is your yeah specialist disability accommodation, um, is the... I call you know the place right it, it's the home where you live and then you also have a component sometimes which is SIL which is um, supported independent living and those are the people so you have your place and your people and quite often they work congruently together funded separately still within all NDIS plan but funded separately in your plan so the people support you in the home that you're living. An occupational therapist is your gold for running a functional capacity assessment, understanding you know, what level of housing do you need? Does it need to be um, fully accessible or you know, high intensity physical supports? Meaning, will we need to run a ceiling hoist? Do we need to have buttons on the doors to open them automatically? Uh, an emergency alert system in case of falls? Or do we need it a little less intensive where it's fully accessible, but you're quite um, you know, capable by yourself. And then from there, again, you would grade as well the level of supports do you need? Are we 24 seven? Are we sleepovers? Are we active nights? And all of this turns into a big numbers game, a timing game as well. Um, and again, it needs to be a goal in your NDIS plan. I would like to live independently. I would like to not have to rely on informal supports. I would like to be able to access the community via public transport. Little bits like that. And that's where your support coordinator or your LAC, like Nas said, can help you with the language when developing either your first NDIS plan, let's say you were transitioning out of hospital, or you've been living with family and now you're feeling ready enough to look for your own living so your next NDIS plan would have the language and the goals toward your supported living. There are lots of different options. It's really important to speak to your social worker at the hospital and LAC if you have it, which is a local area coordinator in NDIS land and your support coordinator as well if you have that also. I that was, uh, you made some really great points there about language. Uh, it's really important that you speak to someone, uh, LAC or, or coordinator, or even someone like Paige, the support coordinator from AQA, just to make sure that you're using the right language. It's really important because if it comes across where you're talking with, you know, in the IS or the TAC and you say, oh, I want this, you're not going to get it. You know, you can't want something and expect to get it. You, you actually have to have a good reason to to have something, you know, and it's all got to be part of a plan, part of your goals and part of a need. Uh, want is a word that I think is going to, uh, you're going to get pushed back if you don't use the right language. May I add to that, Naz, as far as the, the language around, let's call it money or funding, right? The NDIS, and I'm sure the TAC as well, likes to hear value from money. 
what is the thing they can fund one time that won't keep costing? Or how can we fund it a lot right now and then wean off eventually? So speaking to that language again is, oh, I might need this for a while, but I don't really know when I won't. That doesn't sound like a very good investment to either of these funding systems. So again, where's the compromise? Where's the cost benefit analysis? If I am funded for a modified vehicle right now, you won't need to fund transportation for me anymore. I'll also need less support from a support worker, value for money. And then you're getting a modified vehicle and the NDIS is also saving long-term funding. So once again, that language conversation, and there are lots of people that are available to help. Can I also add something? Thank you, Paige. Um, what I find is a lot of people are intimidated um, about the NDIS starting um, their first plans, getting the language right. And yes, the LAC and planner are there to help, but um, people may not be aware that obtaining some support coordination can help them as well. But the fact that they can add that in their plan, um, like adding say 10 hours in their plan for that extra support in, in finding services. Um, also negotiating how you're going to manage a plan, whether, whether it's self-managed or plan managed or agency managed. These are all terminologies that um, people get really intimidated by and don't know where to start. So knowing that you can actually get funded for support coordination, to help you with your first plan and then you should be right in the second year and third year to try and work it out yourself. So um, I find that um, a lot of people do like to go down that path in order to um, understand all about the NDIS, how to get the best out of the NDIS. Um, and also another thing I just wanted to add is that the way you word your goals is so important as well. Um, some people are over generalizing their goals and um, may not be able to get the supports or their equipment because their goals weren't properly stated. That's interesting, Georgina, you speak about goals. There's actually a question, if I may segue into it, Nas. Uh, I might throw this to you, Lockie. There's one here from, uh, I read that probably Malcolm, who talks about sport and leisure equipment. Uh, do you mind speaking to that a little bit? Because I understand that you've used that in your own NDIS planning to because that's one of your goals. Yeah, 100%. Um, to sort of jump back to the last question and then transition to this question, um, from the get-go, I had um, my first NDIS plan. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. No idea. Um, as a support coordinator, I just happened to not be the best one. Um, so after the first year of not really knowing the services, I actually ended up um getting rid of him um uh, working with someone a mentor of mine that knows India as well and learning a lot and what they taught me is the most important part is again your goals right so a lot of my goals are evolved around hand cycling independence um i live in a hilly area out in uh, montmorency so i like to ride my bike around there for exercise but i don't necessarily like to push my wheelchair there so when i'm back to it went to the ndis i said i literally stated that very specifically um, I need to save my shoulders for my training and racing. So I managed to get a smart driver that helps me get around. So pushing around a little chair around there. Um, and then also listing all of my hand cycle goals, what I might need going forward, justifying why that is, why it's going to help me and the costs and how it's going to impact my life. Um, and then because I, I, I did that with my sport, sporting stuff, I managed to move across to other areas. Um, so yeah, there's different levels of equipment that you may need. So you may, they may just try and give you the base. They'll give you the cheapest naturally, right? So if there's a really, really good one and it's a lot more comfortable and you won't get pain for using it, get, get a good OT, a good support coordinator, someone to justify it, and that'll make a huge difference for you. Excellent. Thanks, Lockie. Uh, someone asked, is TAC uh, an insurance company? Now, they run as a business compared to the NDIS, which is, um, you know, it's a, again, it's a, a insurance model, but it's available to everyone as Paige mentioned, uh, anyone that's got a, a major disability uh, are eligible for it. And TAC, of course, it's only Victoria wide and NDIS is Australia wide, but other states have got their own version of TAC as well. I, I understand that TAC is probably the gold product for Australia. 
as far as uh, car insurance or car injuries go. Um, having said that, I think they've lost a bit of money over the last few years and they're trying to sort of tighten up, really tighten up in that aspect. So, yeah. No, very true. You know, I mean, we've heard some things from people saying, you know, they, they're finding it difficult to get funding for different things and they're, they're having to prove uh, why they need it when it's, you know, it's, it's very logical. Yeah, well, someone's got a disability. Someone, yeah. someone was saying before. I think if you can justify it, use a use an OT or a physio or, or an, even an exercise physi physiologist to justify what you want, and that um, that happens. And mm. I know I know TAC are really really focused on the initial part of your recovery, and they and they, they don't mind spending a bit of money there as you recover and as your as your um, progress slows. That's when they really tighten up on the um, on the funding as well. That's what I found anyway. So. Mm. Um, can I say something as well with the getting stuff funded by TAC? Um, something because I've got a few things funded by TAC. What's helped me a lot is um, I've been involved in the process, so I've helped get the evidence to so my the o the OT or the physio can write up the report better. For example, I got a FES unit funded and I kept a diary how it helped like months how it helped um it how it helped my spasms how it meant that I could go to the toilet by myself and stuff like that without help and then the physio then had evidence to show that it did help and that it was a benefit and then that it would cost them less money in the end because it mean less care hours and stuff like that so working with your OT or physio as a team to get your yes. token, what you yep. want funded. It's cool. working as a team together with them, not just them doing all the work. That's yep. how I find I, it. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Yep. The, the other thing I just wanted to say before is um, I think one of the hardest things when you're recovering in, in the initial stages, one of the hardest things is to say what your goals are. You, do, you don't yep. know how you're going to improve over, over time. You just don't know. Um, initially, everyone thought I'd be I'd be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Mm. Well, I've, I've gotten past that. So I think I think having goals is one thing. But you know, yes, I, I think when the TSC asked me, they said, "What are your goals?" I said, "To be as independent as I can," and that's all I can say. So, that's right, because you don't know, do you? I mean, yeah. Everything's new to you. You know, it's, it's really just hard. Not, not like you've studied this or had to think about it before. It's you're in a situation where. You don't know what you're going to need um, or what sort of help. See, I'm different. I've I've done a lot of goals. I've set a lot of goals, um, and I've used that. And there, there's the goals like to get into my wheelchair from the floor, or it was a goal to go to the toilet by myself, or goal to help my spasms and stuff like that. Um, I think setting more shorter term goals that you help with your life and stuff like that can help you do, help them see what you want to do and help them uh, help with your funding what you mm. want funded and stuff like that i think yeah, I'm well, look, yeah, yeah i agree as you as you as you progress along and you start having having more goals absolutely yep yeah and i can i jump into that as well that as you list those goals and yeah, sometimes you might not be in the headspace too, but you can work with maybe support coordinator or anyone about what those goals may be. You may say, hey, I want to be independent. How the hell do I get there? I don't know how to do it. Yeah. So working with those um, allied health services or whoever it may be to getting them, they'll break down the steps and find out what the funding process you need to get to those actual goals. And even if it's just whatever it may be. Yep. Or even exactly. talking to, asking to talk to a peer, peer mentor, like one of the peers. Someone who's been through it before. <laughs> you can Wait, uh, Emily, I love that. The lived experience uh, team from AQA, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. Nas, we need to go back to the Q&A. Got a yeah, question yes. here about transportation. Now, I'm going to throw to you, Paige, about um, the mobility allowance. And then we, we're here for NDIS and TAC. So I might, so I might come back to you, Emily, because my understanding also is uh, TAC help with your travel with medical. But let's start with Paige, uh, mobility allowance. So, yep, transportation funding um, within someone's NDIS plan. Um, if anyone is NDIS funded and under, you know, has, has heard core 
capacity building capital supports, right? Transport comes out of your core funding. So there are three different levels of transportation funding. Um, one is around $1,700, two is around the 260, and then level three is upwards of $3,000. Uh, the more independence you are able to experience in your life, the higher your transportation budget will be. If you've not already re received an NDIS funded modified vehicle. So that's a double up, right? If the NDIS has funded you for a modified um, or modifications to your vehicle or some sort of way to drive yourself, you won't also get gas money, basically. Um, how good would that be? But your transportation funding is essentially um, either paying for a support worker to drive you where you need to go. Uh, school and work are the really big ones where the more you do out in the community to either, um, you know, support yourself or you know, learn or involve yourself in the community, you'll get more funding. And then a level one transportation funding is for, there was a question I saw about um, leisure activities and community access and visiting friends. Yes, the NDIS funds someone to help you to do those things, not the thing itself. So you can't use your NDIS funding to buy a movie ticket, but you can pay a support worker with your funding to drive you to the theater to meet your friends for your leisure activity. I hope that helps that question a little bit, but that's where that transportation budget comes in is the more out and about you are, the higher your level of funding will be as long as you've not also been given um, modifications to your vehicle to drive yourself there. Just want to read a couple of the comments that have been coming through. Um, someone said, from my experience, you need a lot of reports and justification for equipment. Which is, which is true. Again, you know, you need to have the support behind uh, what, what you're saying. And uh, someone else made a good point too. Uh, so this is more of a statement than, than a question, but spending the time and therefore uh, money if needed with an AT or physiotherapist, et cetera, to create the evidence is very helpful. And uh, a lot of people don't think in terms of goals. Uh, this person says, I always change the language to what is it you want to do? So, you know, if, if the word goals doesn't work for you, think about uh, what is it that you want to do? Mm. So maybe, maybe that can be helpful as well. I think it's good, Nas, because I think the hardest thing, and Ian touched on it early on, you know, firstly, I think a lot of this, while you've got to prove the information, also us as individuals have got to uh, walk, work through that, um, you know, mentally to accept some of the language we need to use. Because in some ways you almost got to, highlight you know your dependence or your needs which can be quite confronting for people and you know to articulate those points so uh, as Lockie touched on speaking with allied health or with the peer support we can help you speak this language and uh, make it normal language and um, you know work through those I guess uh, goals. Right, excellent um now, Emily, you're talking about your coordinator. I know, I know it's very helpful to have a coordinator that helps and knows who you are and your disability and all that sort of stuff. Uh, a lot of these organisations, coordinators change uh, roles. So uh, I found a lot of people having to re-explain who they are to a new coordinator. Um, and someone asked, like, are you able to change your coordinator? If you're thinking they're not helpful or they're not understanding, has anyone got to the stage, uh, so this to everyone, where they needed to change their coordinator for whatever reason? Are you able to do that? Um, I haven't had to change mine, but I have asked for someone else how you go about it. And what my coordinator told me, um, which I can post the email thing in, um, she said, you can't change, but you can send in a quote, oh, no, sorry, send in a complaint uh, or and maybe request a different one to an email, I'll post it in and then that's what she said you can do, but it doesn't necessarily mean they'll change it, but if you put in the complaint, they might consider it. Yeah. I'll uh, post the email in the... Um, yeah, no, that'll be good. good question. So I did Another any... question for the Q&A now. Daniel Walters from the Talbot coming in thick and fast with the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, this one might be for Paige, I guess, to speak broadly on, which uh, the question is, would NDIS slash 
TAC sought at a nurse or carer for home. And I think it might be just key to highlight page, you know, maybe that they're the funder and not necessarily the um, the deliverer, hey, all mm. services, yeah. And I will, just off the back of Emily's point, I will offer just super quickly um, in the NDIS world, um, because support coordination is available to you um, in your funding and you get to pick, you can very easily send someone out the door. Um, it, it's really easy to change support coordinators. You don't get to pick the planner you have on the day to help create your plan. There's a delegate that's assigned to you, but once you're funded for support coordination, you can choose to use it. You can ignore it. Um, you can swap as many times as you want until you find a good fit. Um, we are quite expendable, um, but you do have that option. And that's, we. you've probably heard it and we say it, choice and control. Speaking of language, that's what the NDIS um, allows is a lot of choice and control to its participants. Um, and then as far, yes, Josh, um, you pretty much answered it. Uh, a support coordinator, an LAC, a peer, um, even the hospital team, right? Like your physio, OT, um, social worker in hospital, if you've just you know, um, acquired your injury and you're being um, you know, transitioned out of hospital, they can help source the workers and or nurses, the support workers, and then your NDIS funding affords that. So it can be, it is very important if you have a support coordinator to help with the budgeting, so in that pre-planning meeting, let's say you're still in hospital um, or you've had your injury for a long time, but there's been a major development and you need to sit down and reassess how many hours do I actually need in a day? Do I need um, a wound care nurse once or twice a week to check on a couple of things? And can the rest of the week be four hours in the morning, four in the evening to help my personal care routines by um, a high intensity support worker? but it's a bit cheaper than a nurse. So a support coordinator, um, or even if you know, you're many years into your own injury or your funding and you know what you're looking for, a support coordinator can connect you with agencies that maybe specialize in spinal cord injury or specialize um, in psychosocial disabilities and help you a bit there. Um, but that's where someone else would help you pick. And then the NDIS plan is actually the funding behind it. Exactly. Thanks, Pate. So, um, so the answer there is, uh, I guess, you need a carer or, or a nurse, depending on, on which one, of course, you know, a nurse is going to be a lot more expensive. You are entitled to have a carer to help you achieve your daily activities. Someone else uh, also made a, a question here. Well, why will they not pay for assistance with education? So, uh, I'm not exactly sure what that question is, but they will not fund uh, um, educational costs, uh, TAC or NDIS, because that's a, a mainstream thing, but they will fund supports for you to attend school, like um, carers to help you get to school, um, get home, help you prepare, all that sort of stuff. So when it comes to care, helping you uh, get to school and all that sort of stuff that that would be funded but the actual course costs they will not fund um tsc won't cover they'll pay for the carers but they won't pay for the transport or the transport okay tsc only pay for transport for medical things because medical. of injury and stuff like that and you know physio and exercise and stuff like that mm. not to leisure or education or work or anything. Okay, good, thanks. Another question here, does the NDIS uh, fund sports and alternative medicines such as acupuncture? Uh, don't know. Uh, I've seen on want... Facebook someone saying they got acupuncture funded by NDIS, but I just saw it on Facebook. I don't know. Yeah. You know, so again, TAC also funds some of those NARS, so the osteo, also no acupuncture. If it's you know part of your management of the SCI, the injury with pain or whatever it may be. Yeah, uh, I guess to find out for sure, what you need to do is um, probably pick up the phone and and call your LAC uh, because they're really uh, approachable. They're there for that reason to ask that sort of a question. Um, people got to remember that 
<coughs> there's a difference between disability and health. So if you need something that's health related uh, with the NDIS, you're not able to get anything that's health related. Uh, if it's due to your disability, then that's a yes. Of course, you can um, receive um, things towards that. I'm sure if anyone's got anything to add, I'm just um, look, looking at the questions and trying to tick them off uh, as they come through because there's quite a few coming through now. It was interesting though, one, uh, I'd like to throw it to Ian. Um, I know we touched on earlier on about accommodation. And yep. I know, Ian, if you want to speak to it a bit, your transition, uh, being TAC, how you went into Quest and then had to wait for modifications. Do you mind speaking to that a bit? Okay, well, yeah, one of the things that, that um, yeah, we couldn't move back into our house um, until modifications were done. So in the meantime, they've put us up at a Quest apartment in East Burwood, two bedroom Quest apartment. Um, and we stayed there while all the modifications were done in our house, which took about 11 months. So it was a fairly expensive um, process for them. Um, but yeah, no, it was, um, the other thing I'll we'll say with TSC is they also assist with return to work as well. So they actually got me a new chair, a new table that I could work from home um, when, I, when I was staying at the Quest apartment as well. So they, they paid for all that. So yes, it was, it was really very helpful for us. I, 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 I shudder to think how much it cost. So. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for that. Someone else actually answered that question that I asked before. And um, this person actually got acupuncture and osteo, uh, osteopathy service. Um, they got that funded. So uh, the answer is yes to that. Oh, and I'll mention with um, the temporary accommodation with TAC, while you're waiting for your home to be ready and stuff, it doesn't have to be in your hometown. So I lived in Yaroa and my home was, that's where I was going. But um, I, they don't have any accommodation and I didn't want to go to Seymour. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Seymour. But um, I then chose to stay in Melbourne and stay in a quest in Melbourne. And yeah. And, and Quest, Quest have specific um, uh, units for people with disabilities as well. So very well set up. Yeah, it was good. And I know a big question uh, is that, you know, goes amongst the community when we speak to people, you know, assistive technology, and that, that covers a, a whole gamut of different regions. And I know for myself, a couple of power add-ons, you know, to help with my shoulder integrity, get around in the community. I'm not sure if there's anyone else uh, within the panel today that want to speak to their experiences. I can. Go can, you all, can you all hear me? I've had a few comments that no one can hear me. Okay, so um, recently I um, have utilised my plan in terms of getting assistive technology due to my shoulders are deteriorating as I get older and I want to preserve them. So recently purchased through the NDIS a power assist, a smart drive, which not only has helped my shoulders uh, rest for a short period of time earlier on this year, but also my hands as well. Um, earlier this year, I um, was diagnosed with uh, osteoarthritis and uh, a lot of difficulty pushing the manual wheelchair, but my free wheel and my power assist were most, uh, instrumental, particularly because I was going on holidays. And when you go on holidays, you wanna explore um, and push around everywhere, but I was able to use my smart drive. So that's a, a perfect example of um, knowing what's, what's ahead of you, I guess, and looking at um, preserving your body and trying to um, find ways to look after your health long-term and trying to foresee the future. And that's how you state your goals. You want to maintain your overall health and well-being. How can I do that? You actually apply for the equipment that will help you. And um, so I was so happy to have included that in the plan. And then, of course, the, the occupational therapist, the physiotherapist got involved, wrote up the um, 
the justification that is, the NDIS plan approved. And so you have to actually really um, think ahead in terms of your future plans. Sometimes plans are a two year plan and it's sort of, sort of locked in with that. And so um, if at any stage during your, the course of your plan period, things and circumstances change, you can um, elect to have a plan review um, for your funding requirements, whether you need maybe more continence products or another piece of equipment, say a pressure care um, mattress, say for example, or you're finding you're having more issues with your skin integrity as you get older, so you may require more pressure care equipment. So thinking about these things and talking to your physio or, or occupational therapist who have experience of people of all ages, um, asking and talking to them so you can plan ahead for your, your next plan and, and uh, be ready for it as well. Uh, I, can I jump in and add to that as well? Um, I think assistive technology is, is a really crucial part um, because I've, I've heavily used that over the last few years in particular. Um, I know that when I worked at a company that they, um, I've actually advocated for someone and they got a carbon fiber hand cycle. And I know it seems crazy. That's a race style hand cycle. The reason being is because it's quite comfortable. Better get in, avoids neck pains and things like that. Um, and I had a change of circumstance myself where I were, did require more medical equipment and everything. So I had to email the NDIS and get onto them straight away and explain my change of circumstances um, I work with OTs and everything, but luckily I self-advocate and I know what I need. So I just, all I did was tell the OT what I need, just write a justification letter. Um, and it makes a huge difference when you sit down in your plan meeting and you can uh, self-advocate as much as you can or work with a team who's really good for advocating with you. Um, you will get such a better result. <laughs> Uh, someone made a comment here as, as well, just regarding uh, study as well. Uh, in the OS, uh, they will fund like uh, note takers or scribes or disability support workers uh, while you're studying. Uh, that's true, but when it comes to the cost of it, I think, as in the course co um, course cost, uh, they won't fund that. But note takers, all that sort of stuff, uh, definitely they will fund. There's also another question here now is, you know, they're, they're saying, does AQA recommend, but, you know, this is, remember, this is all just uh, general advice, uh, uh, obtaining a lawyer when navigating the TAC or NDIS, but uh, I can probably speak from TAC, my personal experiences, not advocating for others, but um, I used a lawyer when going through the TAC process, which I'm pretty sure from memory they advise as well. I'm not sure if anyone at the NDIS has used a lawyer, but I haven't heard that to be the case. I, um, I'll jump in there too, Josh. I would strongly recommend going through a solicitor as well, someone who is very um, knowledgeable in the TAC area. Yep. Because they think one of the things you don't, haven't heard of. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree as well. I, I went through a lawyer as well. <laughs> That was all TAC people for uh, the NDIS, this page or NAS, Lockie, did you guys use any, apart from a support coordinator or a LAC to go through that process? No legal for me, no, I didn't use them. Yeah, no, me, me either. Um, well, a lot of people um, have trouble get in, getting onto the NDIS or actually getting what they need. I mean, if they need, I don't know, 50 hours of care per week and NDIS are only giving them 20, I mean, that just makes them um, not independent as possible. I mean, they're still relying on family members and friends. In those cases, you can appeal, um, but it's a, it's a long process that you don't want to deal with if you don't have to, you know, but if you've got no choice, there are avenues you can, you can go to, but definitely with TAC uh, or even with NDIS, I mean, uh, if you need the advice and you don't know where to go, definitely, um, you know, seek out uh, legal advice um, from whoever, you know. Um, we can't recommend any, anyone, of course, um, but, yeah, you know, you, you'd be able to just from word of mouth be able to find someone. Can I jump in? Just an important one that... Um... Good question from Karen James. That if something's missing from your NDIS plan, 
can you request for a new plan? Uh, personally, I have done that, but you have to do it straight away because it takes forever. Um, I have done that and got to change the circumstances. I was overseas. They cancelled it, even though I told them, pushed as hard as I can, went above my NDS planner and got my plan reviewed. So yes, that is possible, but you have to push. Um, I'll jump in there quickly as well. Absolutely. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can ask for something in your plan. As Lockie mentioned, if it happens, you know, right when you get your plan, you come out of review, it's the second day you're looking at it and realizing we haven't got one, two, three that we spoke about. Um, that would be an S100, which is an appeal. And it's literally, you know, 100 days within the life of the plan. If you submit um, this appeal document with evidence and with your justification and quotes of what you're needing, that will be reviewed as an appeal of the plan. Otherwise, it goes to an S48, which is a change of circumstance. So similar document, um, but once again, different language and trying to explain, you know, I did have this and it met my needs, but now this has changed in my life. And so it doesn't meet my needs anymore. Like Naz was saying, if you've been afforded um, 20 hours worth of support and all of a sudden, you know, let's say you have a, um, a really bad pressure wound and you're needing more support, you're needing more regular turns, you're needing nursing support. That's a very obvious change of circumstance. You'd submit a report pieces like that. Um, your support coordinator or LAC can help you um, get a bit clever in the justification and the timing of these things. Um, if it is life or death, obviously that um, needs to be addressed and urgently. And your support coordinator, as much as they can, would be on the phone. I've been on the phone every couple of days, ringing the NDIS, asking for the status of where we're at with this, asking for a view. Um, you, of course, yourself, even if you have a support coordinator, can call the NDIS on behalf of yourself. I've called before and then added my client to the phone call. So we're each there just speaking our case. Um, so it does happen. Yes, you can ask for things. Be ready to be able to justify it. Squeaku will page when you need to be. That's it. Yeah, very important. Uh, just on the lawyer uh, question, a couple of people have actually made comments. Um, TAC have funded a lawyer for them. And someone said who uh, asked the question, who funds if you need a lawyer? Um, again, it seems like TAC will in some circumstances. So it's worthwhile asking the question. And a lot of lawyers will take on, you know, uh, no win, no fee um, situation as well. Um, can, I, can I just jump in there, Naz? Sure. Um, with, with the um, law solicitor I had, TAC funded $5,000 worth of legal fees, and then we had to pay a 3000 I think it was. So about $8,000 in legal fees all up. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. And see, I didn't, I didn't know about that, so I think I paid all my legal fees. Oh, lucky you. Can you? I, I didn't know about that, so <laughs> I just paid all of it. Try asking for a reimbursement, Emily. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Going back to the questions, Nas, there's one here from uh, a patient at the Talbot. He's asking, upon discharge, if he's got questions, you know, bladder bowels, nutrition, all that sort of stuff, upon discharge, where's he turn? Well, you know, that's an easy plug for us as lived, uh, lived experience with our mentors, but also for the patients in at the Talbot, upon discharge, you'll also have for 12 months your skis liaison. So that's a, a touch point for you yourself also. And I know from a TACB point of view, uh, with the nutrition question, you can have that funded because weight management is, uh, you know, can be funded as well as for the NDIS, I believe, page, nod the head, yes. And also with the bladder. I know NARS upon discharge, uh, Coloplast, Polystar, they have their own nurses that you can speak to and talk about all the different products uh, upon discharge because it's uh, a whole new world and a lot of stuff out there. Great information, Josh. You know, I think uh, as a starting point, if anyone's got questions, you know, we've got a, a huge team of um, lived experience, uh, volunteers, mentors. Uh, also, we've got our allied health team, uh, AQA Victoria, if people need need carers or have got questions around carers, um, you know, I mean, we can help in that area as well. Can I just ask, Paige, if you wouldn't mind, uh, in relation to the NDIS, um, explaining the three ways that people can manage their plan, um, because... Uh, just and also the benefits of each 
Sure. Um, I'll try and make it a not super long answer. Um, I did notice someone had mentioned in the chat as well that they were self-managed in DIS and asked about spe um, specifications for workers. Um, there are three tiers, like Georgina said, to the management of your NDIS plan. Um, self-managed means you are basically your own accountant, as I call it. So you're in charge of um, bookkeeping and receipts for all of your NDIS funded supports, whether that be appointments, um, consumables, low cost AT, et cetera. And then you reimburse yourself with your funding online through your NDIS portal, which is linked to your MyGov. It's the most flexible in terms of who you can work with. That does not mean you get to pick and choose whoever you want. There is always a chance of an audit. You still are required to follow NDIS guideline. Um, but within that, of course, you have dignity of risk and choice and control. So your support coordinator would hopefully steer you in the right direction. Um, plan management is a middle level where a third party plan management company holds all of the funding for you, but they act as the accountant. So you can still use a range of um, of, you know, NDIS familiar services, but they do not have to be registered. Where things get really regulated is when your plan and your funding is NDIA managed, which means that the NDIA holds the funding and can only be released to NDIS registered providers. AQA, all services are NDIS registered. Um, again, it's, it's the most, um, regulated level of your funding, even um, again, equipment, consumables, all of this for the funding to be paid, it must come from a registered provider. So people who just, just get their plans might be in the NDIA managed bracket because it's very new learning the system. And then as you become more familiar with your own supports, you'll maybe transition to plan managed and then eventually even self-managed. Some people never want to go self-managed. It's a lot of work, a lot of taking care, you know, parents and families and people who work go look that's just a lot leave it with the plan managers that's all good and then on to self-manage back to that quickly um for workers yes abn ab absolutely really highly recommended to have working with children first aid cpr um get your checks police check etc need to keep track of their own invoicing invoice to you as the client and um yeah, if, if you are also NDIS police checked, that can be a big bonus, but you can pick um, a really broad range of someone that wants to work with you as long as, again, you're all NDIS compliant at least. Uh, excellent. Uh, I'm just having a look. I mean, we scheduled this webinar for an hour and there's so many more questions that have come through. It's going to be very difficult answering them all. I think we've answered most of them in, in some way. Uh, I'm not sure if, if, does anyone have to go or do we want to go for another few minutes? My go to keep going. Yeah, I just, I'm just scanning through the questions. I'm not sure if everyone can see the questions, but um, if there's any questions that you can see that we can answer uh, quickly that we haven't covered already. It was, um, con there was a concern about the age limits and um, the people over 65. What yeah. Other what other options do they have? I guess that's a big shortfall. As, as good as NDIS is, um, unfortunately, only funds people under the age of 65. And, you know, there's a lot of people that missed out by a day, for example. And, and what happens to those people? They end up going on to the aged care system. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Ian, Ian might, might have some expertise in that area. But, uh, again, you, you do get funding. You do get supported. But... Yeah, you know, it's it's nowhere near as much as uh, NDIS. No, look, I hadn't needed to go outside of TAC, no, so I don't know anything about that side of it. Oh, sorry, no, it was, uh, I only said that because um, from your employment with Sinali? Yep. I thought you no, might. I, yeah. no, I didn't touch that. Okay. Yep. Um. Now, as if I could offer, I just had a question from Lynn about, because I'm the one that said the phrase NDIS compliant, and then there was a question of what is that? And I was just mm. frantically typing an answer, and I thought I'd jump in quickly. Um, so NDIS compliance, where we spoke about, um, again, you know, there's always auditing, and auditing doesn't just happen when you're self-managed. It happens to plan, um, to plan managers. It happens to registered agencies. It just basically means 
we're all within the system rules, regulations, pricing arrangements. So the NDIS pricing arrangement and guidelines is published. Oof, I don't know if this is right. Maybe every six months, it's regularly reviewed and updated, usually within, you know, um, the beginning of a, a financial year, but it is the maximum that any NDIS, anyone who's charging an NDIS plan is allowed to charge. So whether you're a registered agency, um, you're not, but you're NDIS familiar and you have plan manager, self-managed clients that are working with you, the NDIS um, pays to a certain point and then no more. So if you're self-managed and someone's charging you higher than the pricing arrangement, you can technically pay them, but that could fail an audit where it goes, look, the NDIS has decided that everyone can only charge this much, so not ideal. And for someone who's NDIA managed, that invoice just will bounce in the system. You can't even physically process it. It must be processed at that. So that's one level of compliance is charging at the right um, amount. It's it's safeguards for the participants so that their, their funding is utilized properly by um, themselves and by providers. So it's making sure that you have a record of all of your systems. It's using registered providers um, and you know, using the funding accordingly. That pricing arrangement, it's about a 140 page document. Um, it's pretty dry, but it's got all of um, our compliance answers in there. And keeping you in the hot seat, there's a question around car modifications. Do you mind uh, speaking about that and uh, I guess the capacity that NDIS can contribute? Sure. Um, my experience has been with, um, modifications to a vehicle that the participant purchases being funded, not the vehicle itself. So if that has happened, mm -hmm. I haven't seen it yet, but my experience and so far successes have been in um, modifications being funded to a vehicle. So the very, very first step is um, being cleared by a doctor or your specialist, neurologist, whoever, that you're able to drive. And then you go through um, your, you know, license, um, oh gosh, sorry. You go through a driving you know, test and lessons um, with a specific occupational therapist. A lot of problem I see running into this is you have an OT already, they scripted your wheelchair, they you know, got you a ramp at the front, you love them to death, they're not car specific. You must be a car and vehicle modification educated OT to work in that space. And hopefully your OT would say, look, out of my wheelhouse, but I've got a friend who can do it for you, who's an OT, let's put you on their wait list. So there is a big difference there. And you can have two OTs at the same time, 100%. As long as your funding's available, you can have um, three physios if you can afford all of them. You don't have to just have one. And once again, speaking, it should change. If you're not hearing back from your OT, if you don't get along, if your physio is boring you to death, you can switch within the NDIS system. TAC, I think the same, but that's NDIS. So for your car, yep, your doctor checks you out um, that you're well and able to drive. You get your license reinstated and it's, um, you know, modified to where, you know, hand controls, if you can drive with the pedals, et cetera, to that level, you get your stamp of approval from Vic Roads, and then you go to your OT for specialized driving lessons. So you actually learn how to drive a modified vehicle. And then all of that's done and all well and good. The OT will then help you pick a car within, like then you mentioned, you know, how old is it? How many years do I promise I'll have it forever? Not just, you know, start flipping vehicles that get modified and script modifications to the vehicle. Then once again, this goes again to the NDIS for approval. Then we start the works. It's a huge process. Can take anywhere from probably six to 12 months. Um, I've seen a big range, even within my own clients. Depends on the modifications, doesn't it? So it doesn't um, just apply to people that can drive or just hand controls, but also vans. So people mm. with a disability that can't drive too, so they can get, um, you know, uh, modified vans, wraps and all that sort of stuff, get some automation in it. Um, so that yeah, thanks, to that as well. Even, um, you know, the, uh, the hoist that can, lift your chair up and over your vehicle, things like that. That's part of it as well. So once again, occupational therapy, very specialized to vehicle modification. And they'll have their own providers and their own mechanics that they know and they like really well. And all they do is kind of this. It's a very niche 
um, piece of our assistive technology funding. And as Lockie said ages ago, it's um, assistive technology is so, so important and it's so important to get it right the first time because once it's funded the first time, it's really hard to get the same thing funded again, at least within a short amount of time. Mm. Uh, excellent. Um, just looking at the time, look, um, Tim, do, do we go another 10 minutes or just wind it up now? What do you think? Because uh, I just want to make a comment. There's a few people on here. They're raving about, um, uh, what do they call it? So I'm just trying to find the, the message again. I was just thinking though, well, do we all go around with some key um, points that we want to you know, let everyone go with and then we see everyone from the community, what their experiences are in a group discussion. We buy them all in. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, so um, while I do that, um, has anyone got a takeaway message? Maybe we'll just uh, answer that before we open it up to everyone else. Um, some people are raving about self-managed, um, managing yeah. their own funds. That's really good because the dollar actually goes further, but a lot of people have got fear on that. So if you've got fear, any questions like that, have a chat to us or it might take you a while to work out the system, you know, might be the second or third plan where you decide to self-manage your plan. So uh, takeaway message just from me uh, I'm in the OS, as I said, I only recently started taking advantage of getting my gardening and home cleaning done because, you know, that that's part of my goals now. I was um, sort of refusing to do that. I just wanted to do as much as I could for myself. But uh, I've started doing that. Didn't really know I was eligible for it. And it's fantastic. Best thing I've done. So uh, maybe we'll go clockwise again. Um, Ian, any takeaway messages? Takeaway message. Um, as I said before, I think one of the things I would suggest to anybody is um, legal advice. Legal advice. Get a good solicitor. Yep. Excellent. Uh, Lockie, takeaway message from you. Yep. Um... I'm self-managed myself and my plan. Um, the one thing I would really recommend is at the beginning, we're working really hard with a good support coordinator, getting as much information you can. And yes, it's a bit painful to go on your own. Of course, there's a lot of learning and just like anything else, it causes you a bit of a headache, but it's so worth it. Since I've done that, my flexibility is, oh, sorry, my funding is so flexible. Like I have I don't have to go with NDIS registered places with cleaners and everything like that. And I had a terrible cleaner, so I removed straight away and got a new one. And, you know, and I I really think having a good think about your goals or what you want, if you don't want to call it goals, and then working with someone or if you want to do it on your own, whatever, breaking it down and what you need to get there. And um, it's all part of that headache period. But once you get there, not only is it just going to help your life in general, but it's going to help get the funding you need to have give you the best quality life you possibly can. And also wording. Oh, Word, excellent. Word well. Thanks, Lockie. And Paige, any takeaway messages? Um, we could each write a list of, oh. can I get this funded? Can I get this funded? And That's questions right. and et cetera. Um, if you have funding for a support coordinator, great. Like Lockie said, there's a lot of good ones. There's probably a lot of bad ones. Swap, shop around until you find a good one. If you don't have funding for a support coordinator and you want it, ask that was that you know conversation of do i not have it and can i ask for it absolutely and push and push and always i encourage my clients if you wonder if i can get it funded just double check with me and we'll go yes no or let's try this instead or let's pull it from this category or let's ask for it we really try not to say no um i think it's safer to double check and yeah there's a lot of support out there um you know there's links all through this um through this question list which is really good there's articles, documents, DSC is a really cool website for podcasts and videos, um, NDIS updates, articles, check that out as well. But there's lots and lots of options. Uh, excellent. Thanks. Um, Emily, over to you. Takeaway message. Um, this has kind of been said, but um, I think TAC in my experience really respond well, has responded well to me with goals um, when I set goals. Um, and I make the effort to achieve goals and stuff like that. They like that. Um, and, you know, base your goals around what you want to do or what you want to get funded. Use your goals 
towards that to help you get what you need to get funded. That's, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks very much, Emily. Um, Josh? Yeah, um, just ask questions, you know, because, um, you know, you have choice of control and asking questions of lived experience, they can point you in the right direction to a good OT or what it may be. And um, yeah, and again, just highlighting that choice of control. If you're not exactly happy, shop around, as it's been mentioned before. Exactly. So, yeah, thanks very much uh, for that, Josh. Um, just for everyone, I mean, look, uh, there's a lot of questions that we really wanted to answer and we couldn't. So if anyone's got questions, uh, I'm, I'm going to, in the chat, you should see a link in chat. So just jump on there, any questions, tick the box and we'll get onto it as soon as you um, ask your question or select the box. So uh, apologies if we couldn't answer everyone's question but we can do that by if you follow that link and, and just get in touch with us that way, we can go from there. So, so no, yeah, Georgina go, as well, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, before Josh and Georgina. Sorry no, about that's, that. that's fine. No, I, I agree with everything that everybody has said. Yeah, exactly. If, um, if just not to dwell on a question that you've been wanting to ask, pick up the phone, get in contact with us, um, have your question answered and yeah we're here to help HOA is here to help in any in way and if we're not able to help we'll point you in the right direction so uh, takeaway point is um, pick up the phone ask ask exactly. your peers exactly right yeah uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel the wheel's been invent uh, invented already and um, Josh you had your uh, finger up yeah, um, so this has been recorded. If I want to watch this again, where can I access it? Uh, well, this is going to be posted on AQA's YouTube channel, Josh. So that'll go up in a few days. So if you just go onto YouTube, just type in AQA Spinal, for example, as a keyword or a couple of keywords, uh, you'll find it. And like yeah, it. Okay. When you get onto it, like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, Naz, we'd love our community to give us suggestions as well. It's been a great turnout to this webinar. We'll be holding many of these next year as well. But if you want a particular topic, you know, send us a request. Exactly right. Exactly right. So thanks everyone again for being panelists.